Hey everyone, how you doing? Welcome to Winding On. Let's get Dave in the feed and then we're ready to go. So, uh, hey everybody, how you doing? Welcome to hey, Winding Matt. On. Hey Dave, uh -huh. nice to see you brother. You too so, bro. So, just do a quick introduction and we're ready to go. Hey everyone, welcome to Winding On. My name is Matthew Bowden, the Incorrigible Rogue. Today I'm with Dave Rave Gomez. Dave, as you said before, hey. Hey. It's good to see you. How's life going? Uh, well, you know, it's um, it's been a tough year this year, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, I, uh, can, I can understand that. Yeah, I, I mean, for everybody in our business, it's uh, it's been challenging. And, uh, yeah, it's um, definitely been a tough year. Had better years, that's for sure. Have you managed to do any shows this year? Uh, in January, but nothing since then. Okay, and are you are you looking? I know people are now starting to book up towards Christmas again, but you know, I have one one gig booked uh, two days in December. Yeah, you know that in England now we've all gone back into lockdown. I know, I know, and I'm afraid that's going to happen here again too. But it's pretty much under control here. It seems like. Well, I've heard you guys in Japan because. <clears throat> excuse me because um people are so used to having kind of contagions going on wearing masks doing yeah. all the, the appropriate measures that it's not hit you guys as hard no and yeah people here are just more polite so they just follow the rules you know whereas you know here we have people marching i ain't wearing no mask you can't tell me what to do same in the states right <laughs> i don't crazy. get it like pick yeah. your fights guys pick your fights but this is great you're doing this. This is uh, really going to be amazing when, to have a compilation of all these interviews. Well, I was saying just before we went live, it's incredible to be able to talk to so many people and hear their stories. And one of the things we say a lot of the time when we talk to people about the channel is that a lot of the time, busker stories, stories of street performers, street artists, they tend to die with them and with the people who knew them. The stories don't get carried on and carried forward, you know? Yeah, yeah, especially uh, before all this modern technology. Well, this is the opportunity we have now is to archive, be able to store stuff. And so I suppose when we talk about stories, let's uh, get on to it. Okay. Why uh, Why become a performer? It's, it's a weird old life. It's not for everyone. I know. You know, it was really funny. I was... Uh... I, I, I had a girlfriend in San Francisco and she was German and she was part of a religious cult. Oh, sounds fun. Yeah. The, yeah I don't know if you remember the Sanyasins. No. Uh, well, I, I was born in 84, so I, I don't know if I'd be able to remember them. Okay. So uh, there's a whole Netflix special about him. Oh, wow. I'll definitely check it out. Yeah. It's called Wild Wild West. And uh he he had this uh ranch in oregon he had like got this big piece of land and he was a indian guy and and uh i fell in love with this girl i was never in the cult i i was just like fuck that you know and and we fell in love and then she, uh before she went back to germany she like bought me a plane ticket there to go a one way ticket and i went and I was just like, I didn't have any plan or anything, right? And I just showed up there and I was living in Heidelberg and I saw this guy kneel and he was juggling out there and I thought, oh, that, that looks kind of cool. It'd be like a cool way to travel around and just like make a little money to live on, you know? And so you saw it as that from the beginning, from the first time you saw juggling, you saw the utility of it to be able to yeah. travel around and do shows. Yeah, and I, 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 I wasn't. I lived, I grew up in San Francisco, but I never really saw the performers there. You know, that was like the tourist spot. We didn't go there. Did you perform as a child? Were you in theater groups as a kid? No, not no. at all. I was super shy as a kid. Okay. Yeah, and um, were, you, were you shy at this point? Then were you still? Were you still describe yourself as a shy guy at this moment? No, no. I, I had, when I was out of high school, I joined the navy, and that really uh, changed my whole life. You know, I, for the first time, I was going to foreign countries. I'd never been out of the states, and you know, there's a Mark Twain quote. I believe it's really true, and that's travel. Travel is lethal 
to prejudice, bigotry, and small-mindedness. It really opens your mind. And so anyway, I I um I was not that shy then. And then um, I saw then these two guys that were in the cult came, and they did a show. They were performers. They were I I can't remember their last name, but I remember Harry, and I can't remember the the other brother's name. And um, uh, they were called the Peabody Brothers. But it was just one of them with this other guy, not with Harry. And they were in the cult, and I saw them do a show, and I was blown away. Like, I'd seen Neil, but he was a good juggler, but he, his show didn't really, like, grab me. But these guys, fuck, when I saw their show, like, something inside me just went, wow, how, how did they do that? What's you know, the difference between the two shows then? Oh well, you know, I think it's um it's connection with the audience. So it's not even something practical, it's not the way they transitioned, it's not the presentation. No, it was it was like how they just captured that audience's attention and, and the people were laughing and clapping, and so that night my girlfriend went to the center because they had a center there and uh, did her whatever med meditations, right? And uh, she met them and said, oh, my, my boyfriend, he was just crazy about your show. He can't stop talking about it. And where are you guys staying tonight? And they said, oh, we're not, we don't have a place yet. So well, you can come stay at our apartment because we lived in this place with about four other sannyasins. And um, they came over that night and we got stoned and then they showed me how to juggle a basic juggling pattern. And then I was just nuts. I was just nuts with it. I was breaking shit everywhere in the house. And I was like learning this cascade, you know, because I'd been trying to do the shower because, you know, when you don't know. And once that cascade, it was like, boom. And so I practiced. And then I met these other uh, – other jugglers on the like on the Neca Visa, which is like the grass area by the river, and I met some other jugglers, and then these guys happened to be manufacturers of, of juggling equipment, Koi Co. Okay. And and so they said, oh yeah, we we do this th kids theater and stuff, and I was just like, oh really. And so for about a year, I practiced and I worked with them part time, like. Uh, making clubs and in their shops sometimes. And, and we then, still, we still living with the, uh, the yeah. club members. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was so funny because this is the irony, right? Of all those people that were like, so into it, wore the orange clothes and his face. I never, I was always in black and I was like, fuck that. But, that thing had the biggest effect on my life of any of them, I think, right? It totally changed my whole life. But do you think it changed your life, as I say, because of the proxy connections, or did it have another influence? Well, I would have – no, I would, because of the proxy connections. Yeah, you know? but you just wouldn't have made them otherwise without being yeah. linked into that community. Yeah, I would have never – you know, how everything just lined up is crazy. The right time, the right place. Yeah. And about a year later, my mom came over and we took a little trip and I'd been wanting to go out and try it, but I hadn't quite, man, it's, it takes a lot of fucking guts. You know, people don't realize, well, they say one of the scariest things is to stand up in front of a crowd and speak. And you know, it's true. That's it's a uh, and and so we went to Munich. We took a little tour. I was driving her around, and we were in Munich, and I saw this guy. He was from like a mime school or something, and he was out there with three clubs, and he was doing some really shitty show, right? And uh, and then he called me up to be a volunteer, so I came up and he gave me the clubs, and I just started juggling them, right? And everyone was like, oh, and I went, you know what? Fuck that. I'm going to go to the car and get my stuff. And I went out and just did a show. <laughs> well, what's quite nice, it seems, about that is it gave you a little jump start. You, you, totally. got, you got that ability to go out there without the pressure of, because I describe it as jumping off a cliff edge. 
And oh. so you almost got you got you got pushed. Yeah, yeah. I kind of got pushed. Yeah, and um, so we went. Uh, in what, the just before we go on to that, when you when you did your first show there, how proficient with juggler were you? Ah, uh, you know, I I thought I was really good. <laughs> In my mind, I was great. Five, five I, clubs? No, no. I'm a shitty juggler. <laughs> I mean, I could do three clubs and some tricks, and I think I could do four balls then. But I was I also did magic as a hobby as a kid. So I put in hey. some magic tricks into the show. So I was doing kind of a mixture. But it's interesting you said that, just to go back to your, your early life yeah. as well. You said you was a nervous young man. And one of the things yeah. I've noticed a lot with a lot of magicians is they tend to they tend to be no, nervous young men. Yeah. And they use the magic as a way of starting a conversation with people, as a way of reaching yeah. out, as, as a, a sort of uh, – a mask to join in a conversation. Were you that kind yeah. of person as a kid? I was not nervous. I was just shy. I didn't, I, especially around my own age group, I was more uh, comfortable with adults, you know. Was um, the magic part of that? Was it part of the socializing? And I don't think there's any shame in it, you know. I just I no. find it quite interesting the way we learn to cope as young people, develop no, skills we use later. I wasn't really, uh, I didn't do it for that long, but uh, it just kind of, when I started to perform again, it kind of rekindled my interest in it. And so I put a lot of magic, really stupid. I look back now and I'm like, wow, I can't believe I did that in front of people. You know? And so what sort of stuff are you doing? I did like the, you know, the uh, water into the newspaper and, you know, just these lame tricks, right? The sort of tricks you get in a kid's magic set kind of stuff. Exactly, yeah. And, but I suppose uh, the audience didn't know. They don't know it's in a kid's magic set. They probably well, that's the it. thing, right? And, and what I've learned over the years is it doesn't matter what you do. It's how you do it, you know? And so I, I went, we did a little more tour and we were in Florence. And so I was like, now I was like, oh, I'm going to try it every city we're in. So I went to Florence and there I, I met Stevie G. I don't know if you know Stevie G. No, I don't. Who's Stevie G? Steve Getz. He's, uh, he became a really good friend of mine later, but that, that's how I met him there. And, and he, he always talks about, I came up and I was like, really like hyper. I was like, hey, hey, you think I can do a show here? Hey, anything? And uh, and he was like, yeah, he'd already been working the streets for years. So I I just, that's how it started. I went back to Heidelberg and I would go out every weekend and do shows. And was there other people around you when you was doing the shows? Was it, was it a pitch, you know, with a queue and all that kind of stuff? Heidelberg was kind of a small town in Germany. So, um, there wasn't so many performers coming in there. It was also kind of closed. The cops would shut you down. How did so you I get around that? I, well, I wasn't going out and cranking shows. I was just going out on the weekend, and I would do, like, get enough nerve to go out and do one show. And then I, okay, you know. Whoa. And I'll never forget the first time, like, I made what I, what for me was real money. Like when I saw bills in the hat and I was like, oh, fuck, I can, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and yeah, so that I can was go out and have a meal with it. This isn't just bus fare. Yeah. And that I did for about uh, almost a year. And then I went to the, I think it was a fourth. So just, just before we move on to that. Yeah. When you're doing that for a year, you're learning in a vacuum, right? There's no one else around. You're not you're not was, doing what most few, people do. There was some performers around, and I was working with the Koila and Co. people. So they had this, like, children's theater thing that was I was kind of on the sidelines of. So I was kind of learning a little bit by rote, you know, by just watching. and But, yeah, there wasn't a, a lot of performers coming in there. So you couldn't then, do the thing that a lot of people do. Like when I learned, there's, there's shows out of yeah. the box. You can watch a show. It's all generic. You can just pick that show up and out of the box you have a show. You didn't have that, right? No, no. And from and looking back on it, I think that was a good thing. 
Yeah. It 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 I, it forced me. That's how I got my character. I got my character was really funny because I was in the shower one day with my girlfriend and my hair was flattened down. She said, "You look like Alfred E. Newman from Mad Magazine." And I, and I just put on some glasses to be funny and like, oh no, no. she was like, "That's great." So I started doing that in my shows. So that was very early on. It's like the first year you formed a character. Yeah, not even a year. Yeah. Wow, and that stuck. That stuck for the rest of your performing life. Yeah, and it, and it's evolved over the years. Oh, of it's course. Yeah, you know, but yeah, it just it's stuck. And uh, but it's just so interesting that you can sit in the shower and tell a joke and play I about know. with someone, and then that's that's the genesis for a, for an entire career. Yeah, it, it was like the conception. Yeah, and um, and then I went to the EJA in Frankfurt. I think it was the fourth one. Okay. Do you know what and year this is? It was, I want to say 84, 84, I think. Yeah. Okay. And then, then I saw real jugglers <laughs> and I was like, damn, <laughs> oh, that's what you can do with this art form. And I never really, I didn't, I don't think I ever really had the talent to be a good juggler. I was like, and I'm never done. I can't do five clubs. No, uh, all these years juggling, I've tried and there's never broken that barrier. Five balls, you know, yeah, I, I can do that. But um, yeah, for me, it was more, I like the performing side of it. For me, the, all the other stuff was just the medium to go out and be it's like fun. like a vehicle yeah exactly yeah. yeah it gets you there but it's not where yeah. you're going to yeah and the real birth of my character came in denmark at their juggling convention and uh this guy neil that i told you earlier he was there and he said oh i want to do this routine in the show where you sit there in the audience and then I'm going to bring you up and try to teach you how to juggle. And when I turn away from you, you, you just start doing all these tricks. And so I sat there with my glasses and I bought a big bag of potato chips. And, and before he came out, I was just like <laughs> crunching these chips and being obnoxious. So you're drawing a little bit of focus. There is some, fo what the hell is this guy? That kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I went up and I did it and man, it was like, I, I tell you, I was nervous because it was all these great jugglers there. And, and I went up and man, that, that feeling of laughter from an audience, whoa, it just overwhelmed me, you know? And afterwards everyone was like, whoa, that's a great character. Da, 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 da. And that was really the birth of him, you know? And and so and did you uh, guys work the routine out before strictly, or was it kind of off the cuff? Well, we 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 worked out a little bit of the blocking, like uh, he's gonna okay, you do this, and then he's gonna turn and talk to the audience, and that's when I do some tricks, and then when he comes back, I'm just holding him and like. Uh, oh, when, when you say some tricks, was it like you? I'm gonna do this trick, then this trick, then this trick, or was it just do some tricks? Yeah, just do some tricks. Yeah, so I do over the top and then look, boom, 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 oh, and then oh, what? <laughs> so it's quite improv -y. You you were you were yeah. involved in kind of quasi improv while it was happening. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, and uh, and improv later played a big part in my career, definitely. Yeah, and so I did that, and at the time I was working for the U.S. Army. I was uh, working as uh, at a golf course. Okay. That was the U.S. Army golf course in Germany. Okay. And so after a year, I quit that job. And I just was like, I'm going to go out and street perform. Can I just ask before we go on to going out street performing, why were you working for the Army on a golf course in Germany? Well, I needed a job. And was and street so, performance what, not enough at the time? Because you're street performing at that time. Well, that was, but I, I actually got the job before I was street started street performing. Okay. So I was working in the golf course, and uh, it was a great job, man. It was like, fuck, I got all the, 
I could go to the PX. It was a government job. If I just stayed in that job, I could be retired now with a retirement. It was like a, you know, but after a year, I was like, no, nope, I'm going to fucking do this. And I, I quit and I went up back to Denmark for the summer and man, I had a terrible show, but I was plugging it, you know, and I, I've worked, uh, I've gone. Why some, did, just before you say, why did you say you had a terrible show? Well, it just wasn't, you know, in the beginning, you're just not, it, it wasn't, it was making a little money, but it wasn't boom, you know, and that summer Frank Olivier came to Copenhagen and, and I'd seen Tony Duncan and Steve with Jack the rabbit and they would do their individual shows and then they did a duo show together. And so I was with these greats all of a sudden, right? Queuing up on the pitch. Yeah. I wouldn't even queue up on the pitch with them man. I would go and find my own little spot because I, I knew, well, I knew I wasn't, there was a hierarchy and I knew I wasn't at that level yet. Did you and sit I'm, and watch their shows? Did you sit and oh, study them? Oh, yeah. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Of course. You know, I watched and I learned and, uh, really, uh, was a huge influence with me. And, and at that fest, the first, uh, festival, I met Henrik, my, who later became my partner and he's from Denmark. And so that, that summer when I went up, he said, yeah, I'm going to move to Copenhagen and I've got an apartment and we should, uh, first it was like, we should travel around together and, and do do our individual shows. So just kind of pitch buddies. Yeah. yeah. And it'd be easier if we're together, we can give each other support. But then we ended up making a show, the two of us. And that was a, a long five six year relationship that I had with Henry. So let's drag it back a little bit with that then. Yeah. So you first meet and so when you meet you guys both on the pitch doing shows? No, I met him at the juggling convention. You met him at the convention. Heard. And so yeah. you guys go and do street together. Do you make a show in the juggling convention or do you make a show when you're doing the street together? Later, later that after that summer, we we okay. started I went up to Den I stayed in Denmark and uh uh, the next season we started, we went out, we bought a van in, uh, in, um, Holland and we started traveling around Then we just same kind of thing. It was an organic kind of growth of the show. And, and that's what the particular qualities that made you want to do shows together or was it just circumstance or. Well, I think it was circumstance because, it, like I said at first, we wanted to do our individual shows and just kind of support each other. And and, and then we we thought, well, let's try and do a show together. And then I I'd grown up with Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin, and so I was like, Hendrix was tall and blonde, and I was the goofy monkey guy, and so it was it just kind of seemed to fit somehow. We didn't really we we never. It was funny because we never ended up doing our own individual shows. We just we just started that way and we just stayed like that. And it seems and, like by the sounds of it, you guys had this natural kind of uh, the straight guy and the fool guy kind of thing. Or sorry, the fool guy yeah. and the, the fool, you know, that yeah. you play the, the small, silly dude. He'd be quite large and serious and yeah. how I'm imagining it at least. Yeah, yeah. And uh and I didn't even re know about it then because I hadn't really studied much about theater, but uh, status, you know, the yeah. changing of status. And we were kind of doing that naturally in the show. So well, at one point you'd be high status winning and then you'd switch over statuses between yeah. you. and Exactly. And that's a huge part of comedy. Very mm -hmm. much so. And I, yeah. I read that if you can keep that just wavering between high and low and switching there, that's the place you want to be in, right? Oh, yeah, because uh, if you're both the same status, uh, it's boring. Where's the drama? Yeah, exactly. And so we did that for a year. How did you start? What was your first show like? Ah, uh, you know, I, I, can't, I can't even remember. What year yeah. is this then? We're still in the 80s. Is this 87, yeah, this, 88? This is like 85. 85, okay. 
35. Well, about it, is, it is 35 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I I think we did our tried our first show in in the Leidseplan in in Amsterdam. And are you guys passing clubs? Are you doing the traditional yeah. okay? Yeah, we, we could pass clubs and uh Henrik had some unique tricks and then I had some funny stuff I could do and we would finish by oh we could both play trumpets. Okay. So our finale was uh playing uh, when the saints come marching in on tall unicycles, we didn't even pass clubs up there. Nice. And you, but you don't need to pass clubs necessarily. Yeah. You just, you want to have something that finishes the work. It ties it and in up. The thing, when I first was in Denmark, it was the end of the season. Oh, when I, at, when I, when Henrik and I kind of started to hang out. And so we trained like crazy. Because, you know, Denmark, it's like free gym use. We had this great sport gym. It's freezing outside. And we would train like crazy. We took dance classes. We did all kinds of why would you Why would you take dance classes? Oh, I think dance is uh, super important for any performer. Well, I know it sounds stupid me saying this, but I want the answer. Why is dance super important for any performer? I think, um, well, to quote uh, a really great magician, Jeff McBride, if you want to be a great magician, if you want to be a great performer, take a dance class. Not because you'll move better, you will. But because if you can't go up in, in a safe environment and totally be a fuck up, how are you going to go out in front of an audience and perform? It, it makes you push the boundaries of, of yourself to, you know, because nobody's a great dancer right off the bat, especially when you're doing technical dancing, you, you're going to suck. And if you can't suck in front of people in a class, how are you going to go up and suck in front of an audience? And you have to suck in front of an audience. Because that's the only way to learn. Yeah. You you don't learn. Oh, wow. That was quite sudden and surprising. Hopefully we'll get Dave back in a second. So one of the quick things I'll say about Dave when I was watching him. I was watching Dave's videos. I'm going to look a bit funny while I'm chatting to you. Because I'm going to try and message and check what's going on with him. When I watched. Oh, you're back. That was quicker than I thought. Excellent. Right. We'll get him in. Dave will be back with us in one moment. There we go. Hey, back. Okay. Yeah. So that was um, that was a, a really um, yeah. You learn from your failures. Anyone can have a great show once in a while, but to have, make that consistent, you know, it's you have to fail a lot. And to steal another line from my improv school was dare to fail. You have to be able to go out there and dare to fail. And so, yeah, we, after that, after that winter, we went and bought the van and we started our, our touring. And, and you I guys, that, how are you guys feeling when you get by the van? You, you've worked all winter, you've trained all winter. You feeling kind of yeah. like Rocky going to the match, your match yeah, fit. We were like, okay, let's go. You know, those were great days because, it just felt like everything was so wide open and free. You know, people I mean, talk about, oh, Germany was so strict. and But in some ways, it was more free than America. You know? Is, was this because you were young or is this because it was a different world? I think it was a different era. There wasn't as many performers, that's for sure. And... The ones that were out there, there was a real kind of camaraderie between us because we did feel like we were few and and we needed each other. It was special to see someone in a city center doing a show. Yeah, and to share a pitch, you know. Whereas I suppose now most pitches that are lucrative pitches, you'll have people queuing up on them every time you visit them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, a totally different world. And and so that was a huge, that was, I just, those days I look back with really fond memories. And, uh, and during that season in the summer, I went back home. 
Okay. And, and now I thought, wow, this is not just like a hobby. Maybe I should study it. So I was in San Francisco and that's when I took my first theater workshop and I did a two week uh, workshop with intensive workshop with the San Francisco mime troupe. And that just, and that, and that, that was when I met Robert, the butterfly man. I met all the San Francisco street performers yeah. and that workshop just, I, I came back to Europe to Henrik and I was like, Oh, now I'm ready to fucking kill. Can you go into the workshop a bit more into what you think you gained, what you learned there, how they taught you? I think it, it, it wasn't so much what they taught me. It was more, uh, the, it was like the fish hook that got me. It, it was like, Oh my God, this theater world is huge and fast. It's a deep ocean that I've just been skimming the surface of, you know, we did Del Arte. They do a lot of Comedia Del Arte, which I never even heard of, you know, much less like tried. And at the end of the workshop, we broke the class into two groups and we each had to take a piece out of the paper and make a Del Arte routine about it. And so that really got me going. And, um, and uh, Del Arte is such a helpful thing, I think, for street shows because they're very, they're very simple characters. And I think for any, anything, yeah, Del Arte is, is really uh, uh, an amazing art form to learn. Even the history of it is incredible. Yeah, and uh, it's a very long know. history, isn't it? Yeah. And so that year we worked again. We stayed the winter. We trained again. And how's your show now? Has your show changed after going to the States, doing the theatre courses and coming back? Oh, completely. And since then, I've done a lot of different courses. I I did five years of theatre improv in San Francisco, um, Bay Area Theatre Sports, which was... When, when's that? Is that much later in the story? Yeah, that's later, yeah. So yeah. what we'll do if we can, we just keep to chronology, okay. otherwise we're going to get really confused if we move from yeah. bit to bit to bit. So, so Henrik and I plotted along. We kept working. We had some great, great times in Europe, man. We um, we we thought we were the funniest fucking guys in the world, right? And we would we travel in our van, and you know how people hitchhike in Europe everywhere. So we would we were like these evil clowns. We would pick up hitchhikers and we'd be wearing clown noses. And they they were already like, okay, and they'd get in our van. And then once they got in our van, they were a little bit, they'd see the unicycles hanging in the window and all this stuff. And we'd, we'd go, oh, uh, would you please sign our, our guest book? Because we want you to, we have a, a guest book for people to sign. And we had a guest book with a pen in it, right? And the pen was an electric shock pen. So, <laughs> <laughs> they were, I think some of them were scared we were gonna kill them or something. Right? These guys are crazy. Yeah, and uh, and we we ended up meeting some really great people though. And then we, man, I wish I had that book because we had some great stuff written in there. So people know? did end up writing in the book. It wasn't oh, just a... Yeah. Uh, yeah, we definitely wanted him to write in the book, you know, and uh, it was just uh, hilarious when we when we come up to the borders because they had borders then, yeah. right? It wasn't the EU; you had to go through every country, you had to go through a border, so like, a, we, like a hard border. Yeah, with a checkpoint, wow. a border patrol, you know, and we pull up. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd be wearing the clown noses and we'd put a little red sticker on our passport photos and we'd give them to the guy and they'd go, get the fuck out of here. We never got stopped when we wore the clown noses. I suppose they just thought. Yeah, they were like, oh, get the fuck out of here. And the only time we got pulled over was going from Luxembourg into Germany. And we got pulled over and we didn't wear the clown noses that time. For some reason, we didn't wear them and they pulled us over. And this fucking guy, man, he searched everything. And Henrik used to do the Rocky Raccoon. And Henrik has 
had a weird sense of humor. He thought some things were really funny that sometimes weren't. And and he had the thing in a in a little cage. And so when the guy goes to get it, he goes, Oh, Zerga Fairlish, oh, that's very dangerous. And the guy was like, oh, and he drops it and he goes, let me get it out. And he gets it out. And the guy's in the van, right? And and he kind of hunched over and Henrik jumps it at him. And the guy fucking goes, ah, and boom, just smacks his head on the top of the thing, the roof. And oh my God. And I'm just going, oh, fuck, we're going to jail. <laughs> fuck, they're going to take us in. But luckily, the guy's supervisor was there, and I don't know. I don't think he liked him very much, and the supervisor just laughed. He thought that was the funniest fucking thing he'd ever seen, and he was like, get the fuck out of here, and we ended up going, you know? And so it seems like you guys were really carefree at this time. It's not like you're sitting there counting your hats out going, right, we didn't make enough much money from here. We have to go here and do this. You know... Um, the money was so secondary to us. We were making all right money, but we weren't like, we were just having fun, you know, and we got lucky. We caught a few places like uh, Luxembourg when we got there. It just happened to be their anniversary or their like, I don't know, it was like 100 year anniversary, some weird thing. It was just packed. And we thought, fuck, this place is a gold mine. Nobody's ever been here. We did like, I remember we could do like 10 shows, you know? <laughs> and I think we did like six shows that night, right? And we wow. were like, fuck, we had all this money. We were like, yeah. And we went back there. And of course, that place is totally sleepy, right? We were like, where do all the people go? And you got Golden Week. Yeah, we got the Golden Weekend. Yeah, it was amazing. And how did your guys, did your guys work change as you were traveling around over the years? Did you develop the show into something which it wasn't at the beginning? Oh, totally. Yeah. It, you, I mean, you can't help but for it to, but to develop into new, you know, we, you, you would, you'd have something that would happen and then, oh, we got to put that in. And of course it takes about a hundred times of doing that before it's funny. Like it, before you can do it, like it happened naturally. It's acting, you've got to right? emulate that spontaneity. Yeah, it's acting, right? And we were, we didn't know anything about acting. We were just hacking our way through it. But it's not just acting, because acting, if you could pretend you're surprised in the moment, if, if you do it out of context, it's meaningless. You've got to have well, the context right, the crowd manipulate. Believe it. Say that again, sorry. If you're a good actor, you can make people believe it. 100%. But all I'm trying to get at is with a street show, mm. you think nothing's controlled. Uh, you need to find the right circumstance. You need to prep all the conditions yeah. for that joke to have context. Of course. And you're trying to recreate those takes a, a, lot of, a lot of repetition before it becomes natural like that every time. Yeah. Someone once told me a really good street show is a well-rehearsed show that looks improvised. Very much so. Very much so. Yeah. And so uh, we didn't know any of that stuff then. We were just going through and chasing girls and having fun and getting stoned and, you know, just <laughs> hitting the pitches. We'd try all these different places and, yeah, it was it was very exciting time for for us. Did you ever have any problems? Could you say you went to all these borders? Did you ever have any problems with people checking your work permits or anything like that? Never, never. I was a fucking tourist visa. They never said anything about it. I lived in Europe for five years. And how long was your tourist visa for? Well. 30 days, but then you just go to another country and you or, or 90 days and you just go to another country and it's you come back in, it's another 90 days. So you just kept cycling, going from different country to different country. No one's checked, no one looks in your van seeing all these unicycles and thinks you're working. They just no, think you're great, crazy holiday makers. Yeah, they, I don't know what they thought, but we never got asked anything. Well, that's maybe something different in the world now. I know so many people oh, go to countries with their gear. Different. Very different. Yeah. Very, very different the world then. 
there was a lot more freedom, I think, in some ways. I talked to well, Super Scott on Monday, and he said the first time he went to Australia, he went with his gear, and they turned him around and sent him back. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Australia is really strict, you know. And, yeah, and I think a lot of countries nowadays, those were some really carefree days, and we were lucky to to live them, you know. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll all turn into fascism and then the generation in 100 years will have those same days again. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> <laughs> so why stop touring with Henrik then? You did six years, you said. What, it seems yeah. like it was a good time. Why, why stop well, doing it? We, we, we relocated to San Francisco. Okay. We went to the States because we thought, oh, we, we need to go play with the big boys after – I think it was after three seasons or four seasons, we were like, okay, we got to go. I, we felt like, okay, we can we can hang with the big boys now. Did you ever so do Covent Garden in London before you went to America? We did do it once, yeah. Henrik and I did it one time. And just because I ask a lot of people, because my my home pitch, I'm always interested. When you went there, what did you think of the place? Uh, I, I thought... Well, that was like the first kind of controlled pitch I'd ever seen. So I thought it was kind of strange. Okay. And I'm sorry. Just that you have to get a time slot. And, you know, we were used to like go on the pitch, someone would show up. Oh, yeah, we'd go on. We're going to, and we worked it out ourselves. There wasn't anybody regulating it, you know. You didn't have to be there early in the morning because I hate mornings. Yeah, and I think at that time it was like what six o'clock in the morning or something, yeah, seven o'clock yeah, in the morning. Hot, and it was just, I just Did thought you, it was bullshit. You know? Were the were the people nice to you? Were the people quite standoffish? They were a little bit standoffish, yeah. They're trying uh, to elbow you off the pitch, kind of thing. Hey, who are you guys, and what are you doing on here? And you know, you're gonna st how long are you staying? And and we They're had amazing. no. Interest. And we had no interest in England, actually, because it was like to get there was a pain in the ass. And then, you know, it was, Europe was just easier. We could drive. We, we had Germany down. Germany, Switzerland. and then Again. So, as I said, every interview I do, I like to talk to people in Covent Garden. And I think, isn't this interesting? that Covent Garden, when it began, is quite a controlled place. And now, in the end, seems to be one of the freest pitches in the world because everywhere else has become more enclosed, whereas Covent Garden stayed the same. Uh, hey, Dave. So, yeah, you were saying you didn't, weren't really interested in England because you had Germany down. Yeah. Germany was our bread and butter. I mean, we loved it. Uh, I loved the German audiences. They loved us. Uh, we had our great little towns. Uh, Freiburg, which hardly anybody went to. We would do Freiburg and, oh man, on like a Friday, Saturday night, we had the spot and it was great. And and uh, I have a great story. So we're in Freiburg and we're, um, we're going to go try this festival that we read about in Memming Memmingen. It's this little town in Bavaria. So we've got to, we leave Freiburg on, I think it's like a Sunday or Saturday afternoon and we're driving and we're picking up hitchhikers all the time. And we see this looks like beautiful blonde girl hitchhiking up on the road. Right. And Hendrick's driving and uh, <laughs> he turns to me and goes, should we stop? <laughs> I'm like, no, dude. We pick up every grody fucking hitchhiker forever. Let's leave the beautiful blonde girl. Yeah, we fucking stop. And we get her in, and she's gorgeous, man. And she, God, I wish I could remember her name. And, and we, we do the whole pen thing, and she's like, ah, and the clown noses, and she's just loving it. And she's going to go. to. She wants to get to the Audubon to hitchhike to see her boyfriend in Stuttgart, but we're going past it. By the time we get to the Audubon, she's like, I'm going with you guys. She's on and the adventure. Up, yeah, and we end up taking her there, and Memmingen was horrible. It was, didn't work out, so we're like, fuck it. Let's go back to Freiburg. So we drive all the way back to Freiburg, and she says, you can come stay at my house. 
right? And now her and I are hitting it off and I'm like, yeah, but it's her parents' house. So we show up there and <laughs> this poor German family, right? They open their door, their daughter's there with us. Wow, well, noses on. Of course. And we come in and we start hugging and kissing them. Mama, Papa, we're DK, how are you? And we go, literally, we go to the fridge, just open it up, pop some beers, and like make ourselves at home. And they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> but are they okay with it? Are they, do they allow it? They did. We stayed there, like, not once, but when we went back, we stayed with them a few times. So they put, oh, the, the strange performing people are back again. I think they didn't, weren't too happy about it, but somehow her daughter made them do it somehow. <laughs> Fair enough. Some place of the adventure. And so you guys moved to, was it Seattle you moved to? No, San Francisco. San Francisco, sorry. So you guys moved to San Francisco to do yeah. shows with the big boys. How does that work out for you? Uh, well, we went, we auditioned for Pier 39, which is the premier spot. And the guy at the time, our show was definitely different. It definitely didn't have that North American street show, you know, ah, nah, nah, la, 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 kind of feel. We were from Europe, so we had a different vibe. I was more into clowning and, uh, and we had and so when you said the American style is kind of like, it's a selling, you're selling the piece. It's like yeah. your old 1930s stop show. Check this out, gather around, gather around. Yeah. Whereas you guys, you, what we say like clowning more. So you're playing with the audience more or you're more and, we're, and, and acting off of each other a lot more. Okay, and it's and, a lot more, it feels more anarchic. Yeah, but we did realize it was interesting because the Americans were more into technique. And our finale, we had to change it. We ended up passing torches on the tall unis. Because they wanted Just, to see something skillful and dangerous. Yeah, something that was, yeah, the trumpets weren't just quite enough. And we realized that. And, um, and yeah, we we made it on the pier. We did the anchorage, the cannery, and we were there with the big boys, you know. And it was what it did was, what did the guy say in the audition? Oh, he, he loved us. He loved us. He was like, "Wow, yeah, yeah, I've never seen a show like that." And we'll definitely. And at that time, there was they were really stingy with their slots. So at the time, it was like we had to share a slot. We had to share like. When I mean a slot, like uh, they get so many days a month. So we had to, we got like one of those things shared with two other performers. And so what, you'd get Mondays or you'd get... Uh... Or, or no, you could pick days. You, they'd have a running order at the, they'd meet once a month for the next month thing. And they'd have your name on a list. And then they'd go down the list to pick their days and then go back up the list. Okay, so it's like the draw in the Edinburgh Fringe, say. Instead of doing it once per day, you do it for a month. Yeah, yeah. And then you could have your schedule. And then those days were like gold. So if you got a gig, you can trade those days. They were legal tender. And you could trade them. And then if it... Like cigarettes like, in prison. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Without the gang rape, yeah. <laughs> Usually. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was San Francisco after all. But, um, and then they had cool, like, if I traded, like, let's say I traded, I couldn't work Friday, and you traded me that day, and then it rained on the day I traded you, then you, I don't, I have to give you another day, so you don't get screwed out. So it was a good system. I later used it when I uh, ran City Walk here in, Japan. Because it was a system you thought was fair and it was, I thought it was the most fair. equitable. I, yes, I definitely did. And I, uh, this going down the list and then back up because the guy at the bottom who got the last pick gets two picks now in a row. So you don't so, get a good one, but you get two crap ones. Well, and you still get good days. You know, you still get good days. There was plenty of days. That was the thing. But when you and say we, days, is the one show a day there then? No. No, there was like, like on the pier, you'd have, oh, 
there'd be at least at least I think a twelve and two, a four and six, a seven thirty. So twelve and two, four and six, seven thirty. And a 9.30, and then sometimes you could do the late show. So you'd have three different performers on in one day. And so or when you, you say you, you pick your day, you pick a show in a day. So say if I... You'd, yeah. you'd yeah. pick like Tuesday, 12 and 2. It's open. I'll take that. Yeah, I got you. So everyone's there with their schedule, and they're trying to fill it in. And Yeah. Let me get my diary out. Yeah, yeah. And, and how, and, how did the community so some interests me with this right yeah um the way i see community and street performance is by cues and daily draws and they keep everyone together so that when people are doing shows there's always a body of performers in the vicinity watching the shows chatting with people about the shows and it becomes like a, a, a creative melting pot or if not creative melting pot a melting right. pot for craft if you've got everything booked up on a month on a on a once a month basis, do you guys still have that same? Did you have that same community? It was a different type of community. You definitely no. You you usually didn't see the other performer till you finish your show, and he's showing up to get ready for his next one. Yeah, fair and enough. You, and you'd get quite a few slots in the month. You know, you'd get not just yeah. one day. You'd have like you know you'd have a decent amount of slots. You'd yeah. Make good money, you know. Um, there's not the money that's necessary that I'm so interested, but I'm interested in the community if you guys had there. Were people staying around and watching other people's shows? How do you guys develop as artists if you didn't yeah. have other people chiming in with it? Well, for me at that time, because once we got to San Francisco, I started getting more interested in theater. So... We did have that, though. We did. It was just different. We would meet at Fred Anderson's studio every Thursday night for juggling night. And we, you know, I was a different, it wasn't on the pitch kind of a thing. We would, but we did have that community. It was just a different So all, all the shows would meet up at um, Fred Anderson's place. I assume you had a high ceiling place. Yeah, not all of them, but some would. And... Yeah, it was just different. We would all go after the meeting. We'd all go have breakfast together. Uh, it was just a different – it's not the same kind of on-the-pitch thing. Yeah, but there was still a community of people. You still felt like brothers in some way. Definitely, yeah, definitely. And we would, you know, watch other people's shows, uh, like finish. If we didn't have anywhere to go, we'd stay and watch the next guy's show or, you know – uh, hang out. We had some time to overlap and hang out and chat. Uh, was there was, a thing it, where performers would turn up for the new guy and check the new guy out? There wasn't new guys. Really? Because that thing was, well, not on the pier because it was closed. It was hard to get in there. They didn't have just, you know, oh, any random guy can come. You had to audition. Once you got in, you know, like I said, we had to share a, one of those slots going down the list with three, two, three of us. And how many so, people in the draw? How many bodies picking these slots per month? I'm trying to remember. I think there was there wasn't that many. It was quite a closed little uh, community. So, yeah. I mean, every now and then a great act would come into town that Robert knew about or something, and then he would say oh this act's coming or someone would give them one of their slots so that they could go on and do a show so there was a vouching system in some way a limited vouching system it was more i wouldn't say a vouching system i'd say it was more a personal system you had so to, if, if you knew the you know, guy you could you could give give somebody a slot just so they get an opportunity yeah to try it yeah. yeah, and so you but said you get. Oh, sorry, mate. Carry on. Yeah, but a lot of people came there and they were very disappointed that they couldn't work on the pier. And Fisherman's Wharf was not a. a there was not a good pitch to work there. And was that was that an open spot that you could work? There was no open spots really. There no. was no like. No, it was all pretty regulated. That was the first time I'd really experienced that. But we had four spots we were regulated at. At the cannery at Ghirardelli Square, the Anchorage, which was new, and Pier 39. 
So we were working every weekend and, and weekdays, you know, a lot of weekdays too. And were the shows good there? Yeah, they were great. They were great. Like the pier, that was like, well, each place had a stage. So it was very different to be on a stage than just have a circle. Had, had a stage? Yeah, everywhere. Every pitch had a stage. Wow, that's strange. So it's almost like they're not street shows. If you've got a stage, it feels different, right? Oh, it's, well, it's a hybrid. It's definitely a hybrid because you still have the street show um, feel, but you're definitely showcased. You definitely, you look more, it, it looks more legitimate. But you also don't have a drunk guy coming into the middle of the show and getting his dick out as often, I imagine, no, if you're on a stage. Have, <laughs> yeah, you'd still have that. <laughs> Good. I'd hate to miss out on those opportunities. Oh, yeah. Or fucking, I had a group of gang members come in one time. Fucking. Uh, How did that work out? <laughs> it was pretty fucking good. I totally trashed them in front of everyone. And we didn't get jumped. They ended up laughing with us. So that was good. <laughs> <laughs> can go one of two ways sometimes eh? yeah but you, you know this you're talking about this community thing and I, I tell you that with the street performers I've I've yet to find somewhere that really has that kind of a community thing because uh, where, to go back a little bit at one time we toured uh, four of us when we went uh in 80, when was that, 85 or 86, Stevie G this, uh, was staying with us in Denmark, and me and Henrik and this uh, Danish girl, Bentha, um, where it was fucking freezing in the middle of Denmark winter, and Bentha calls us and says, I'm going to this Hawaiian juggling convention. You guys want to go? And we were like, fuck yeah, I found these cheap tickets. So we flew to Hawaii and we did a little U U.S. tour, Hawaii, Denver, and we uh, went to San Francisco. And then we went to um, New Orleans. And I got thrown in jail for street performing without a permit. Wow. During, during Mardi Gras. And... So I was there and Paul Morocco was there. We got there on Friday and you needed to get a, a permit. But the office is closed until Monday, but I wanted to work the weekend. So Paul said, oh, you kind of look like me. You can use my ID. So I was like, great. So Saturday we go out, we start our show, and the cop comes by and goes, that's not you. <laughs> he goes, where's your permit? And I go, oh, I tried to explain Fucking, they handcuffed me and took me to jail. Wow. And at this time, I used to do a strip tease in my show. And I would strip down to these boxer shorts, and Henry could come up behind me and pull them down, and I was wearing an elephant face G-string. And so they take me to jail, right? And they, you know, it's Mardi Gras. Like, they put me in the drunk tank. I walk in. I'm in my fucking costume with my <laughs> And they throw me in the drunk tank and all these guys look at me. They've been in fights and shit, right? And they're like, oh, fuck are you? And, and, uh, and I was just freaking out because I'm thinking, wow, if, if they keep me overnight, they're going to take me to central booking where they strip you and put you in a jumpsuit. And I'm thinking, oh, man, what, I don't want to fucking show anyone this G-string, right? <laughs> and so... This is what a great community they were. Fucking Steve went out and passed the hat amongst the performers. And they raised my bail. In fact, one of the biggest contributors was Michael James. And he was making big bucks. That guy had a show of nothing but finales. And he was cranking. And he was like, how much do you need? And he just took out a wad of money from his hat. And boom, there you go. Get him out of jail. And they fucking bailed me out wow. that afternoon. And so what happened to you in the end? Did they give you a fine or? I got fined, yeah. Big fine? 
No, it wasn't bad. It was like a hundred and something bucks. Or... And then Pretty Monday, crazy. Monday I went and paid my 25 bucks and got my stupid permit. <laughs> it always amazes me how strict America can be when it's a place that has this ideal of freedom of speech. Yet they'll arrest you for it's, performing it, on the street. It's well, this is what I always equate it to. You can tell a civilized country when you can walk down the street with a beer in your hand. Yeah. Because that means people can fucking pretty much control themselves. When in the States, you just can't do that. Right? New Orleans is a prime example, man. They because there you can walk around, people drink and they get fucked up and they're out of control. So the cops are just but it's huge revenue for them during that time, right? They're so, just looking they're looking to get you to churn money through for the council. Exactly. Okay. So you, know, you said after this you got into theater a lot during these yeah. times. Well, yeah. actually, no, no, sorry, before we get to that, um Hawaii, juggling yeah. uh, juggling convention in Hawaii. So we go to Hawaii to this crazy fucking juggling convention. And this guy, Graham Ellis, uh, who lives in England now, he's back in England. He um, has this idea. He found this piece of land and he wants to people to buy in, join him to buy this land. And... I didn't even go. I was like, fuck this guy, man. He's nothing but a scam artist, right? I'm going to give him two grand. It was two grand to join, to become a member, right? I was like, fuck that. And so Henrik, though, was totally like, man, oh, I got a choice. He goes and checks it out, and it's 10 acres on the big island. And, uh, and that summer we go and we work. And we're making pretty good money, you know, at that time. And that w was back in Europe. So we, we were still living there. So we go, we go back to Europe and work that summer. And at the end of the summer, I'm like, Henrik, like, there's, where's, there's like $4,000 missing from our account. And he's all, uh, yeah, well, um, and I'm like, oh, dude. You didn't fucking buy into that fucking Hawaii thing, did you? He goes, yeah, I did, and I, I put in your money, too. I was like, oh, man. We're never going to – now we got to go back because – You're invested. <laughs> You're like pissing on a tree. We got to go piss on our fucking mark our territory. <laughs> and that ended up being another huge part of my life that if Henrik hadn't have done that, I wouldn't be a part of. So you, you you thank him for that in the end. Oh yeah, definitely. I was like, and we we were ending up being founding members, and actually they didn't want some of the guys didn't want us to join because they thought we were too wild, right? We fucking performers in the states, they're so conservative, and you know, and we were just running around naked. We were used to being in Europe, right? We were running around naked and we were fucking, you know, we did this show where we wrote Aloha on our asses and we moved the audience and they were like, these guys are too fucking crazy. But we, did get in. Trouble yeah. Kids. Yeah. but we did get in and, and man, that's 30 years of, of, you know, going almost every winter. And so my, the, the first winter you went there, what was it like? What was the place, the beginning of it? Oh, my God. It was a fucking nightmare. It was, you know, it's fucking jungle, right? Raw jungle. We were, like, hacking our way in, and you'd take a sledgehammer and smash the lava rock down, and then a wheelbarrow full of, uh, like, gravel cinder, lava cinders, and to make these little trails and then we'd like stake out a spot and and it rained like crazy and we had a tent with a tarp over it and it was just fucking so you're proper <laughs> living like in the wild this isn't oh, a chalet oh no chalet it was it was brutal man mosquitoes you fucking bit all over you know so why you keep coming back then because we started developing it, you know, it, it started coming together. And later, uh, Henrik and I put houses on there. We, we, they had how 
you could buy two tier membership. You could buy, everybody had to be a member. And then he had a select few house sites. So Henrik and I had bought each a house site. I didn't buy mine till later. I bought the very last one. Were you sick of being a, under a tarp at a tent? Oh yeah, I was like, fuck that, you know. And are people juggling there all the time? Is it a performing community? Are people are sharing skills, and it's. Uh... It used to be, yeah. It used to be. Uh, now everyone's gotten older, and uh, it definitely is not what I wanted it to be. I mean, we did some amazing stuff there, especially Graham. You know, he built a big performing arts center there, and that. Uh, for me, it was all about uh, the kids, teaching kids, you know, to to kind of pass on the skills. And I was really into that side of it. Um, and they local kids you're passing the skills on to. Yeah, yeah, mostly, yeah. And is, has that been sustained? Is that still going on? I, yeah. I see some stuff coming through. They do uh, a cabaret it's still going on. Yeah, it's still going on. Well, I'll get into a separate Hawaii thing. Okay. later because that's cool. a whole different fucking story there um i've i'm selling out my share now i i don't want any part of what's going on there now i'm i'm done with it it's i'm ready to move on uh it's the same with hap happened with henrik and i we were just we were ready to go out on our own and do our own thing you know and uh i was, was definitely it, were you still friends Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're yeah, we're still we're like brothers, you know. So um, it wasn't a messy divorce because I keep talking to people about this, and it always seems like it's kind of a marriage, you know. And some marriages end well, and some don't. It's definitely a marriage. No, um, it's uh, we're really good friends still. We still keep in contact. Um, uh, we, you know, during the years in Hawaii, we would always pop in and. Uh, see each other and, and so you know our kids played together and we did a lot together and we definitely are two different personalities and it's you know we're two different people that's for sure and uh, but that's probably but, why the show worked in the first place well of course yeah and so during that time in San Francisco I started to get into I started I got a uh, I started to get into theater sports what's theater is, sports it's it's basically improv theater, you know. You go up with nothing. You ask for a suggestion, and and that really got me going. And then later, I got a after Henrik left, I got a job at the American Conservatory Theater, okay. uh, ACT in San Francisco as an usher in the theater, which was just like it didn't pay crap. It was like twenty five bucks a week or something, but I could. I could go and see shows, all the plays for free, and I got a free class at the academy every wow. semester. So I started taking the academy classes, and I started doing, you know, Stanislavski acting shit. You know, so you start learning methods. Yes, yes, and I was already learning a lot from the theater sports. I think any any performer just like with the dance class should take a performance class theater sports go in there because you have to fucking lay it all on the line you, you can't hold back you know you have to open everything up and just be willing to fucking be sacrificed you know and and so th that really started to develop me a lot was the theater classes the Bay Area theater sports that was a huge started to really change my, how I started to think about performing and, and stuff. Can you go into that a little bit more about the how it changed you and how it changed the way you thought about performing? Well, okay, so like in theater sports, uh, you have to become selfless, and so a lot of people will have a routine and something will happen. And they'll ignore that because they want to do their routine. But if you think of it as like an interruption, it will be. But if you think of that as an offer to do something, you 
have just opened the door into, you don't know what. It could go great. It could totally fall apart. But you can always go back to your routine you, or go to the next one. But you, if you don't open that door, you don't know what's over there. So that, in that way, it really changed the way I started to think about performing. Did it give you as well, because <clears throat> it's one thing to say, open the door, and opening the door is great. And when people come into your show or when something happens in the show that's unexpected, to be prepared to utilize that is great. But then you also have to have the ability to utilize it, right? Hmm. Yeah, well, it definitely did that through its the techniques that you use in theater sports, which is learning how to accept offers and and react to them and you know give back and boom boom this exchange and and the key is to be selfless to not drive your thing at them you know and it's hard to do it's a difficult thing to do especially you know performers we all have egos so we want to be you know the man and so learning how to like accept those offers and work run with them is, is huge. I think it's one of the, one of the more valuable tools a performer performer can have is learning improv theater because you're going up with nothing. You have nothing. You start with nothing and you build something. And I suppose it's a muscle, right? If you're, you're training a creative muscle there. Of course. Yeah, of course. Uh, Ovner, said after I did his workshop said uh, you know now go do a lot of shows because that's the only it's like a muscle it's the only way you're gonna get good you can come and do all the workshops in the world but that ain't gonna make you good you can you know you got to go out and do shows and, and fail you know trying to do those Techniques. Um, I suppose that's the joy of the street is you have the opportunity to do those shows. That's where a lot of people don't have that opportunity. If you have to go and get a booking every time you have to do a show, it's it's very difficult, I assume. Well, yes and no. I don't know. It's because on the street, you can, in some ways, you can get kind of uh, stuck uh, going to make the money. And you've got your set and you want to do your set. I found a lot of times I have more freedom at a paid gig because I'm paid and I don't have to, you know, and I'm, I'm still giving them a good product. I'm not going to go out and try some whole new random thing, but in there I can try other stuff. But I suppose like, you don't need the, I assume we'll be back in a second. So the thing I was going to say to him is in a paid gig, it, it seems in a street, you need the audience to be in a certain place for you to get paid. And, street performers need to get paid you know it, everyone needs to live you need to feed yourself and so if you try something in the middle of a show that leaves your audience moved and stunned and and pleasured in a way but you don't have them in a certain state of mind by the end of the show it's going to severely hamper the, the money you make in that show whereas if you do a paid booked gig and you leave those people stunned and happy and and in a particular place there isn't a necessary a place where they're going to take money out of the wallet and give it to you but it's an experience that they they can cherish and savor then maybe that's where you can experiment more the only problem i have with that is i've been traditionally terrible at getting myself gigs and so i i don't know if i'd even have the opportunity to to work a show through enough to do that I'm just going to check with Dave now. So excuse me if I don't look straight at all of you. I've watched Dave's promo before we did this. And what amazed me about Dave's promo is he did so many different things. He, he seemed super tight at, at magic. At, double check, he's not coming back. Super tight at magic and juggling and then clowning and dancing. And the guy has done so many things to such a high quality. Sorry, I'm typing what I'm saying. Are you coming back? And I suggest maybe, and I've seen this a lot of time with people, maybe being in the Navy when he was young and having that discipline when he was young, getting, getting taught how to live a reasonably functional life, which 
being in a, a, a military of some kind tends to do, having this you know formula for living through your day, enabling him to work and train and practice and have the, what's the word I want to look for? Have the commitment to become good at this. You know, a lot of people who I chat to become great in what they do, but they don't necessarily go, right, I'm doing this. Now I study this, now I cram, now I work this. And that's perhaps something that comes from this idea of being trained. In the Navy, you are trained. And he doesn't seem like a guy who's ever been afraid of training, you know, working harder, being taught and being humble. Uh, I think Dave's back here. He should be back in two seconds. Welcome back. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that was weird. It looked like I was on, but it, somehow I cut out. It, we get sometimes with the app some connection issues. So carry on, buddy. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the theater sports, the, the acting was really uh, helpful. And then in 1990, I got my f- – uh, Henrik and I actually, we, we got a gig in Japan. That was the first time we came to Japan. And were you getting a lot of gigs before this? Or were you generally street before this? Because you said um, that you said before we well, went offline, you were talking about having more opportunity to play in gigs. Oh, yeah. Well, we were we were getting some gigs. Um, yeah, we were doing some. Um, but the pier was kind of like a gig. We treated it like a gig kind of, you know, because we, we knew that was – you know, guaranteed money. Yeah. So we, we did treat that like that. And we were doing some gigs. We had some really funny ones. Like we did a gig for the California Highway Patrol. That was just a bunch of cops. And, just <laughs> and Brian put Halifax 88 in there as well with a question. Mark. Oh, oh yeah. We, um, we went to Halifax in 88 and, uh, we ended up on the pitch and it was like this weird pitch. It was the, I think it was the Hilton hotel had this huge lawn and uh, there was me, the checkerboard guy, Henrik and Brian. And we showed the three acts showed up and we were like, Oh, we have to share this pitch, but it was so big. It was like, we thought let's try and uh, we'll do a four person show we'll just team up and we'll do this. And so two guys would go out and on unicycles and call the audience in and two guys would stay there and do pre-show. And then until we got that lawn full, we did like hour and 15 hour and 20 minute long shows. And the audience was happy to stay and watch for. Yeah. they could. Yeah. It was like an amphitheater kind of, they could sit on the lawn and, Oh, we had massive fucking shows. So we ended up doing that whole festival. We went to them and said, we want to keep this pitch. And we were like, we, I think we would have won that festival if we had just put all the votes in our number, one of our numbers, but we ended up combining our numbers and uh, made a new number and they wouldn't tally it. But we ended up winning an award there. And that was amazing. And that's how I met Brian and Checkerboard Guy. And uh, that was in 88. And then Henrik, on the way back, he got fucking stopped at the border. They wouldn't let him on the flight back to San Francisco because he didn't have his, a visa for the States. <laughs> So we uh, we started dealing with that. That was a big thing with Henrik. So and did they hold him or did they send him back to Europe? They kept him in Canada and then he, I forget how he got in, but he did come in later. He did get a visa. Okay. I think he got it in Canada. And so um, we, did we get to the point where you got booked in Japan then? This is the first, one of the first big gigs you guys do in Japan, right? Yeah, it was uh, 1990. We went to the Hanahaku. It was the uh, flower festival. Huge expo. Like, massive. Hot. Hot as fuck. Japan summers are brutal. And, wow, it came back. We just had a... That was a good paid gig, you know. We did really well. So you weren't hatting there? What's that? So you weren't passing the hat there? No. 
No, we were we got paid for that. We did three shows a day, and uh, I, I the first time in Japan, I really didn't like it so much. Why? I don't know. I just was too like I was living in San Francisco, and I had all these. For me, felt like freedom. I had my motorcycle. I could ride up in the hills, and it was a lot of nature and. It was just so fucking sweltering hot, and you know the the staff guy at our place was just a dick, and it was just like I just wasn't too crazy about it. And then, and I went back to the pier, and I was working alone there. And how was it to work alone? <laughs> how was it to work alone for the first time after all these years? It was it was good. Um, it was really good. You know, I I. My show was developing, and I was, how was doing. The, how it. was the first show? Because I assume you weren't when you were with Henry. You weren't working your I, own street show I, in between. I've done some shows on my own already, so I I didn't feel intimidated, and I I'd already been doing some of the improv classes, and I, I didn't. It wasn't too too much of a leap for me. Yeah, I didn't feel like it was such a big jump. And, and just uh, getting things tightened up and getting the structures working and that kind of thing. Yeah, and learning how to work off the audience as opposed to Henry, you know. Did you find yourself at some point in the first few shows looking across and having the instinct to play off somebody else? No, no, not really. I transitioned pretty well into it. Yeah. And I was, and and then I was going, damn, and I don't have to split this money? Oh, that would be great. <laughs> oh, I was making twice as much all of a sudden, you know? Well, that's always the thing with a double act, isn't it? You you don't have to work quite as hard. You can do interesting stuff, but you've got to give away half the hat to the person you're working with at the end of the show. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, so then in 92, I got a chance to come back to Japan. And right before I came back, I had done a, uh, a tour with... Um, that was really funny, me and this girl, and we, we got hired by this company that we did elementary schools up and down the West Coast. And we would do plays, but it was only two of us, so we had to run backstage and change costume and come out as a new character. And we did, um, we did uh, what is it, a Christmas Carol or uh, the one with Fagin? And, uh, oh, that's Oliver Twist. Oliver Twist, we did Oliver Twist and we did Aladdin. And so I I got the script and we did the rehearsals and it was with this theater guy who was, you know, some hack theater dude. And and I was like, this script sucks. I was like, this isn't funny. And he's like, no, this is great. Kids are gonna love it, but you gotta do it like I tell you. And I was like, okay. So in the rehearsals, I did it. And are you getting and waged? Is he giving you a wage? And that's why you're not like, Not him, yeah. but the company that we hired us. Yeah, we were getting a wage. So you're getting paid to do a job. It's not like you can argue too much about it, I suppose. Well, I went on the road. And the first night on the road, I had her drive. And I said, I'm rewriting this whole fucking script. Said, this shit's gone. This is gone. We're going to do it like this. And I just took what I knew from the street and applied it to that. And we had like the kids just raging, laughing. They were screaming. You know, I had to be like the old blind father for the uh, for Aladdin's lamp. And I would go out in the audience and uh, I had like a bandage on my eye like I can't see. And I'd go to the biggest, fattest teacher and I'd fall in her lap. And I'd be like, oh, what are you, what are you doing? And, and the kids would just fucking die and we had like a little bit of a budget so i went to the magic store and i bought like for the for the evil wizard i bought like a float the floating ball and i put in all this corny ass magic stuff and they just ate it up you know and i I just can i ask you a question yeah why do all of that what you're gonna get paid the same no matter what why put the extra energy in I just couldn't go out and do – it was an interesting thing because at one point the guy told me, 
if you don't do these jokes like this, those kids are going to eat you for breakfast. And I looked at him and said, it'll be a fucking cold day in hell before a bunch of kids eat me for breakfast. I eat children for snacks. <laughs> I say, you got to come down to the pier and see one of my shows. Then you'll know what the fuck I'm talking about. And, and he did come down and see one and was like, oh. And then he had a little more fucking respect for me. But I, I don't know. I just couldn't go out. I couldn't. You can't go out and do a sucky show when you can do a good one. You know, you just can't. And the luckily, the girl I was with was really good about it because she, she was into it, and she and we played off each other really well. And for her, if she's a, I take it she's more of a theater-driven person. Yeah. So yeah. To, to get that person to work with who's got the understanding of working a crowd in the way a street full works crowd must have been a very yeah. fun experience for her. Oh, it was great. She learned a lot. She finished, yeah. yeah, she learned a lot from that. And I had done that gig because I was just, I got an offer to do it. And I liked the girl. She was really nice. And I she was one of my mates in the uh, ACT Usher thing. And so... Um, that I did that, and then after that, Dave Cole called me and said, "Oh, I got this. Uh, I got this. Um, I got this gig in uh, in Japan, and it's a this big festival." And uh, I see Mardine and just said, "Hi, Dave." And and Mardine and Rick had just won it the year before, and it was like it was kind of like America's Got Talent. It was, you had like uh, seven variety acts from Vegas. I'm talking fucking shit hot fucking acts, right? Seven minute acts, right? They're, that's what they do. Just right? super tight to music. Bang, oh, bang, 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 bang. Yeah. <laughs> boom, boom. Uh, dun, 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 you know, there was this guy, Dario Vasquez from Mexico, man. The guy did 50 tricks in five minutes. Are they good you know, tricks? Good tricks, though. You talk about high yeah, skill, yeah, difficult man. things. Oh yeah, five clubs, four clubs, three clubs. Do, 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 do. Bounce a ball on my head. Do skip rope at the same time. No, ping pong balls. Five ping pong balls. Blah, blah, blah. The guy was unbelievable. He starts off. He runs out. Does like back handspring, back handspring, open laid out backflip. Boom! Right to the music. Then, then, then this Spanish music. You know, it was just amazing. And I came out and I was like, I fucking did the high throw with the Diablo. <laughs> you know? And I won. Wow. And you won because of the character and the way you play with the crowd, I assume, then? Of course. It was all about... Uh, the it's been a choppy interview. What I find interesting about what you just said, about winning, and I'm sure when Dave comes back, he can fill it out a little bit more, is athletics. So this guy doing his hand sprints, ba da 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 to the music. Juggling five clubs, skip rope with a ball bounce on your head. You can put show stuff in there, but these are essentially athletic feats. I watched a guy in James Street near Common Garden juggle nine balls, flashing nine balls. And I watched a guy make about 18 pounds in a day, doing about four or five hours of flashing nine balls. Because athletic stadiums, are pretty empty but then when you go to a stand-up gig it's full when you go to watch entertainment it's full people want to be entertained they want to feel joy they want to feel excitement they want to engage with a character they want to understand that character they want to try and unravel who that person is what they're going through empathize the audience is essentially, in my opinion, an empathetic organism. It's constantly looking at what you're portraying and trying to empathize and put themselves in your head. There's very little to do with that when you're watching someone do athletics. You know, when you're watching someone do a feat you can't do. It's a very difficult experience to empathize with. And all you've got is the fact that that's difficult. I can't do that. So Dave, I think he's going to tell us about winning then. So, yeah, you, you won against all the big high school athletes. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, uh, I was there with Big Nazo. I don't know if you know who they are. Um, really amazing puppet characters, band singing. 
and they're, they're counting down. There was four prizes, and they're like, and I, I knew I had a good set. I knew it, you know. Well, why is, and, your, set, why is your set good? What, what You say you had a good set. You're throwing a Diablo high. It's not got anything necessarily just, high skill. I just knew I, I had them. I went out. Okay, this is how I know, because I went out. It was fucking sweltering hot. There was like a 1,000 people. I went out, and they, they were like this. And I, I, I did go a little bit over time. There was a little bit of a, a controversy because I went a little bit over time. But when I finished, uh, how I had to, a little bit. So you get 10 minutes slot, right? Five, five minutes. Five minute slot. And how long? Did and you I do? think I did six and a half. It's and not that bad. yeah, but for, for them, because it was being filmed for TV. Right. And I knew. I knew I had a good a good set because when I finished, the whole crowd was like, I fit, had my music playing off and they were like, <coughs> <coughs> it was just like the great clowns I'd seen in the circus when they go off and the whole crowd's just like. <coughs> and how did you play? Did you go out there and play with the crowd? Did you do a lot of crowd oh, interaction? Yeah. Oh, did, yeah. Were definitely. you a falling foolish clown? What, what I, was the kind of thing you did? I did. Um. I, well, I went out. I, I I did a watch steal, but I did it with a plant in the audience. I had a plant, and I, and I I did a watch steal, and I done I did a Rocky Raccoon. I mean, I really did like nothing. I really, and then I and then I just had uh, Madonna's Vogue come on, and I did a few tricks, with, really bad tricks with the Diablo. In fact, I fucked up, and it got tangled. And everyone was laughing and I'm like trying to untangle it. And it just was like, and then I just did the high throw and they were like, wow. And, and I really went for it. Like they, they had, you know, these huge lighting rigs set up and it, I just had this little area to go through and I fucking went for it. It's outside windy and I nailed it and they just went nuts, man. Great. And so it was just like one building up to that one trick, you know? And, and it shows you as well, the trick doesn't have to be a big high skill trick. It's exciting. It's got something in it, but it's, well, I'm going to get to, we, we got to revisit that point because okay. later when I went to Genting, uh, I was working with a really fucking good, so good juggler. And it's, Again, it's it's something deeper. It's that connection to the audience that you make. There's you have to give something, and I think one of the one of the things that I learned from Avner, which was huge, was he said, "I'm not an artist. I'm an entertainer." And what's the difference? An artist is selfish. He doesn't give a fuck if you like what he does. He's doing it because he wants to do it, and that's it. You can like it or leave it. He doesn't give a fuck. An entertainer is selfless. He will adapt. He will change to suit whatever audience he has. And that was like a huge epiphany for me to, to hear that. And so 92, that was... That was a huge year for me because uh, I I uh, I left San Francisco and I I I came here and I I won that and after the festival was done I I had thought to myself I want to stay in Japan I'd always had a little fascination with it even though I didn't really like it the first time uh, but I still there was something I was into martial arts I'd been doing some martial arts in in um, in the states and. Uh, so I thought I'll stay for six months. Just um, to just before you say stay, what did you winning get you? What was winning that competition do for you? Well, I was on a TV show. Um, I, I had an entertainer visa. I had a visa. <laughs> that that was huge, and um, and I won five grand plus all the money I'd made on the street. Right, it was like two weeks of street performing. And so I assume a lot of gigs could be lined up quite easily in Japan for you after that as well. Well, this was the thing, right? Um, I would, I'd, 
I knew Brian was here and I'd met Brian and I saw like, he was out doing shows and he was out doing street shows and he was killing it. So after the gig finished, they were like, well, where do we take you now to the airport? And I was like, uh, no, I canceled my flight. And they were like, what? It's like, yeah, I already rented an apartment. Just take me here to this address. And they were, so then, then they called me into the office and they were like, cause I'm on their visa. So they're responsible for me. And just at that time where we were working, where we did the, the festival is a tempos on it's called, it's a aquarium and a marketplace. It's a big pitch. It's a giant fucking pitch. And it was brand new. And there was tons of people coming. And that was the first legal street pitch in Japan. So they were giving out permits and I got the first one. Wow. So, I would, it's like catching a wave, man. I was the first one up, man. And, and I, and so then they were like, well, we're worried that you're going to go out in the streets and perform. And I said, well, fuck yeah, I am. I got to make money. And they were like, well, we're responsible for you. And I said, well, then you better get me some fucking work, huh? <laughs> and, and they did. So I ended up stretching that three month visa into six months. And after that, I got another gig in Tokyo. So you didn't do the street then? You said you had the first street permit, but you I did. Didn't. Well, there I could work because it was it was permitted. They didn't okay. want me going out in the street street. Uh, street street. They didn't want you to yeah. relegate. They didn't want like you to get pitches, arrested, basically. Like the pitches Brian was doing. I mean, Brian was a fucking pioneer, man. That guy was hardcore man he fucking was going to places where people just never even thought of doing it i mean there was no one here doing it you know nobody had the skill level or the fucking formula of how to do it you know well brian so talks they, about in his interview and we will get his interview back online soon everyone it'll be in the next couple of weeks hopefully we'll get brian's one he talks about how when he first went to Japan, people told him that Japanese audiences don't laugh. Oh, yeah. They told me so much bullshit. They were like, they don't get irony. And they're very shy. Bullshit, man. <clears throat> and especially with Brian's language level, I mean, he could communicate with them at a level that you know, it, it's all about the language. You know, uh, you, if you can communicate with them, you can... Uh, you can really, uh, I learned a lot with Brian because just from the communication side, because later on we did shows together. We had a great team show here and we'd go out and work tempos on and we had some big fucking shows, man, massive, huge crowds, big hats. Like, oh, it was the golden days. We thought they'd never end, you know? Well, everybody thinks that I had the, not necessarily the same thing, but I had golden periods in London before it got very busy with performers. And yeah. people told me the same thing. They said, you know, this will end. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's go to the bar. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then, yeah, then, um, so I, I made it a year with on entertainer visas here, which is pretty good. And, and then I was here a year and I thought, well, I should, uh, I should stay. I want to stay. I didn't know how. And so I found out you could get a visa for studying Japanese culture. So I was living in Juso, which is uh, kind of uptown in Osaka. And I found out there was an Aikido dojo uh, right in my neighborhood. And not just an Aikido dojo. It was the dojo that Steven Seagal used to own. And his wife, ex-wife was the head teacher there. Wow. So I went to go see a class just to watch. And I saw it and I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. And I was like, I went that after the class, I went down and signed up. And I got a cultural visa to study Aikido for a year. Wow. Yeah. So I, I trained fun. like Monday through Friday. I was full, full on training six uh maybe maybe 15 hours a week or something and then do street shows the weekend yeah 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, at this point, did you do Renegade? Is this when you thought, well, I go do some other pitches or? No, I, I mean, Tempo's on was so lucrative. <clears throat> and, and I was getting gigs too. So I was getting a lot of gigs and, and Tempo's on was great. And so I didn't really need to renegade that much. Did your show change when you were working the streets in Japan? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know if it – well, right before I came in 92, <clears throat> I that girl that I did the theater show with, she was like, let's make you a suit. Your character needs a suit. And so we went down – to the fa she could sew and we went to the fabric store one day and got some patterns and she made me this suit and that was like well and then my character really took on a whole new persona so your character was just the glasses and the hair before and kind of and, and shit i bought it at thrift stores right? so it, it did it have a feel of a costume to it or was it oh, just yeah it definitely did but it it wasn't like that suit why what's the difference between between one and the other that suit was just it just was like the cherry on top it just finished it off you know and is, is there a thing that it, the character made sense completely then is it yeah kind of like that yeah. yeah and then later um i i went and uh, then, then my life really changed a lot. The during that year of Aikido, I I met my my wife at the at the time. Well, she was my girlfriend, and started dating her. And the next year, we got married. So I was wow. here on a spousal visa. You don't get you don't get a green card for getting married here. Wow. So is it a, it's a it's an indefinite visa? No. It's a one-year spousal visa. You wow. have to renew it. Yeah. And, and then... And so I, to renew it, it is we're still married, basically. If you get divorced, yeah. you leave. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you're divorced, you lose the spousal visa. And but, then after, but it seems like you're really setting down roots in Japan now. I started, yeah. Then I started really... I mean, I, I had everything I, I needed here. I really liked it. I was starting to learn the language. I loved my training at an Aikido. I love the Aikido family. And I was starting to, there was started to be a performance community starting to grow. What's going on with that then? What's going on with the performance community? And bear in mind at this moment, I think we're in, let's double check the time. I think we're in the last 15 minutes of the interview today. Oh, okay. So if we can, time flies, say hey, an hour 45. Wow. It's amazing. And yeah. everybody has the same thing. So what we can do if it's okay is we do 15 more minutes and then we can sure. pick it up. At a later date, yeah? Yeah, no so problem. Really nice thing to end this on today is the, the starting of a performance community there. So there was a few performers, um, local Japanese people, and they they had there there had been a Barman Bailey clown school in Tokyo, clown college. So they had all learned that, you know, the fuzzy hat and the big shoes and blah, 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 look at me, uh, you know, but they hadn't seen people like Brian or I really in, until then. And so they, they started coming out to temples on, they got permits and they would come out and do like one show and, and then leave all dejected. But because you know. they'd see you guys having these huge crowds, they go out there and play the kind of kids kids party clown. And yeah. It, and it wouldn't work. Yeah, exactly. And so then it started growing. There would start to be more. And then they started learning. You know, and then they started learning. They were like, I mean, Japanese, when they fucking get their fucking teeth on a bone man they don't let go they you know they they worked hard they work hard and they did you know and they and so how did you see this learning start to grow did guys turn up without the makeup at the pitch and start yeah, going ah started, started getting characters started to you know and then it was getting to be more of a thing here they they had the uh the Dido Gay Fest in Shizuoka started. There's, you know, they they had they'd already had some gigs in Japan, but there was you know starting to be there bringing foreign performers over. 
So uh, they were seeing a lot more acts and they were learning from that. And they were training like crazy, right? They were becoming really good jugglers, right? Within a year, most of them could out juggle me. Because you know? they were just, you know, nose the uh, the grindstone kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. And were, were you guys giving them hints? Were you helping or were you guys kind of a bit? bit I tried to be, I tried to be very, uh, I was very supportive of them. I, I was always tried to be very supportive of them. And, um, I, I think, uh, like just, um, not too long ago, maybe two years ago, uh, I've been, I've been working on the cruise ships and so I'd never really, I, I didn't get to go out on the holidays and stuff, but I went out because I was here in my free time. I didn't need to get a gig. I was like, Oh, I enjoying Japan for the first time really. And like, I went down to the pitch, this one pitch that Brian and I had done. And I think I was the first one to do it. And, um, there was performers there and I went up and I introduced myself and like these young kids, I'd never met them. And they were like, Oh, I, Oh yeah, dude, I know you, who you are. Wow. And, and so I think that's really, um, very, um, yeah, it's very nice for me to get that feeling of like, Oh yeah, you, because you, you can't be selfish. You gotta, it's, it's a growing art form and there's going to be. And so, I inspired a lot of people and I, I'm Brian did too. And, and it's, it's, um, it, you know, we were the pioneers here. We were the fucking pioneers and we inspired all these. And, and it just grew, it grew and they've heard of us and they know who we are. And well, and people probably people who they learned off probably watched your shows when they were beginning and saw this is how you do it. And, you know, part of you and your work probably exists in them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for sure. And and it's it's uh, I always. Yeah, I, I got along always really good with the Japanese performers. And uh, I, I always was very happy to be around him in the dressing room at Temple Zone. And we just, it was a very nice feeling. Was there a day when you looked around and you realized they're really, they're here? You know, it's, we're not, we're not the big guys in the pitch anymore. Now it's a level playing field. Um, yeah, but that came around the turn of the century. I saw there was a huge change. The performers had gotten good. The, the bubble, end of the bubble thing had kind of worn out and uh, it wasn't, you know, the fruit wasn't just low hanging anymore. Yeah. Uh, you, had to, so, you had to compete. It was like being yeah. in Europe as much as, you know, it wasn't an untouched land. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's their language and their culture. So they kind of, I, I don't personally like some of the the stuff they do but it works for them because it's their culture why what do you mean so <clears throat> i'll give you an example almost every japanese performer does this at the end of their show they'll say oh this has been my dream to to do this show and they get all they do this corny emotional thing and and i'm so glad you can let me fulfill my dream and and for me, I just go, oh, that's really bad acting, and it's fucking corny as shit. But the Japanese people eat it up, right? <laughs> so uh, I, I, one thing when I watch other performers, this is one thing I've had to train myself to do is not watch the performer as much, but watch the audience. Because I have my feelings but i have to watch what the audience sees i completely see what you're saying there's a couple of performers i see in coven and i i watch them and i go this is awful i really don't <laughs> I like know. this the lines aren't honest. working yeah. it doesn't make what they're saying doesn't make sense most of the time yeah. you look at the crowd and the crowd loves it they're, they're engaged they're smiling they're laughing they're they're completely focused right so brian just wrote who was the eight 
uh, nine, nine ball, ball juggler. So in, that, <clears throat> this is kind of a, a story that ties into Tempo Zone because um, I went to Genting uh, a few years ago and um, I, I was there on my last, I did three contracts there. I loved it. People hated that gig, but I loved it. And uh, why did people hate it? It was just, we'll get into that in the next interview. But I got to tell this story because uh, I got there on the, my last contract there. And there was this, this kid, 25 year old guy, nine ball juggler. And there was another clown guy there. And then there was this other technical juggler from Italy. Now, I didn't know it, but this this nine ball juggler, fuck, he was a technical juggler. Like, but somehow he could connect with the audience. They loved him. They loved him. He was making good money. And did he have a, did he have a personality, a character? Did he, he did he know how he to just, play? He just he kind of looked like one of these anime characters. He had this like really cool costume, and he had this. He was really into anime, so he looked like one of these cosplay kind, a little bit. And, and fuck, the guy could juggle like a motherfucker, man. And his finale was nine balls. He didn't do anything high. And, and I, I, I gave him some tips. Like, I did some things. I, I helped him with his show. Like, just little things I saw and I went, boom. And was that I like no? It was this thing of have you thought about doing this here? Have you thought about adding this yeah. thing? Or like this a, is I, too much? I, I told him at the end of his show he should get on his knees, which is a, a Japanese seiza, it's called, and you get on your knees and you bow and say thank you. I said you should you should do that because you're Japanese and they love you, and when you do that, you're gonna just steal their hearts. And he started doing it, and so we're backstage. And talking, and he says, uh, "You don't remember me, but ten years ago, when I was fifteen, I was." He was from a different town, Fukuoka. He said, "My my class was on a field trip up to Temples onto the aquarium, and I saw your show. And in fact, everybody wanted to go shopping and stuff. And I said, no, 'No, I'm going to watch this guy.' And I saw all three of your shows that day. And he said, "You're the reason I started juggling." Oh man! Yeah, and oh, so, so then I told him. I said, "Okay, now it's on, bro. The old vet and the young buck. We're going toe to toe because we were making the money. We were making the big hats. That, and it was so strange. You talk about that athleticism thing. That that Italian juggler. He was fucking great, but he just couldn't make money." And the other clown too. He well, he was not funny. He was just horrible clown. <laughs> and I'm not gonna say any names, but 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 me and Satoshi, fuck, we were going toe to toe. Like we'd come back and we'd oh, look at that show. Oh, we counted out in front of each other, and we were like like a boxing match, right? And the old the old fucking know it all vet and the young buck, and we're slugging it out. And I'm doing like, I don't do more than a cascade hardly in my show anymore. You know, <laughs> it's just, and so it was like this non-technical show and this technical show and we were battling it out. And it was just the most fun rivalry. And we just had so much fun with it. And, and it was very, uh, yeah, very inspiring that I inspired someone to that degree. And can you imagine as well how much you made his experience there? So he's yeah. not just met the, oh. the person who inspired him, but then he's got to have this experience of playing and competing yeah. with and being, being oh, to you toe know, to toe, yeah, toe to toe with me, yeah. He was and toe to toe. What's the what's the word I'm looking for? Being a peer to the person he began with. What a great yeah. experience to give this guy. Oh, what a great experience for me. You know, for me, it was a, a great experience. I mean, it was just, uh, yeah, very, very inspiring. For him too. So I don't know if we can end on a better note than that, to be honest. Is there anything else you want to say to everyone who's been watching? Oh, uh, yeah. I want to say hi to Sarah. She was also at Genting. That's where I met her. She's from the Big Island. And uh, 
And Mardeen was a, a, just a great person to be around. And Dave Aiken writes, don't bring out Binky the Clown. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 uh yeah it's just here's the community you know you got these it's just these people i've met that have uh been uh so such a huge and inspiring um community for me and 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 have been there for me especially brian recently who has been there through a really hard time in my life and you know uh that i couldn't really have done alone and to to have that is uh, very special and i'm very honored to be a part of it yeah well that's a beautiful point to end the interview with dave it's been Thanks. an absolute pleasure talking to you. it really has and i you can't too. wait until we talk again Everyone who's been watching, guys, thank you for watching. It's been a wonderful interview. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Dave, you. stay on the line. I'm going to say goodbye in a sec once we're off. Everyone else, goodbye.